I used to think. I used to think. I used to think. That I went to church. That I went to church. I used to think that church was some building with a steeple and a sound system and a big bathtub to dunk people in. I used to think that church was watered down apple juice and flour cookies. I used to think that church was a lot of stand up, sit down and stand up again and then give us all your money. I used to believe that a Sunday morning service would change the world, get people saved, make Jesus happy. I used to believe that before I showed up to church, I had to pray to clean my mind of the things I saw on the web, ask forgiveness from the lies I've told, and vow to give back the things that I have stolen, and promise to be a missionary, or else God would not hear me and then I was not welcome. I used to think that singing was the highest form of worship, second only to wearing a tie and dress shoes. I used to think that church was to only be run by a few who had large degrees and big titles. I used to think if I really needed to find God, the best place to start looking, the best place to start looking was in the walls of the church building. I don't know anymore. I don't know anymore. I don't know anymore. I don't know anymore. I don't know if much of what I've been brought up to think about church is really true. It has been easier, neater, and more defined. It has rules and processes and can be reproduced. It's done some good and done much bad. It was safe, reliable, even sacred. It was convenient, it was friendly, it was purpose driven. But was it what God intended the church to be? I mean, I have to believe that it tried, but somewhere it lost the heartbeat of God. Somewhere we, the people of the church, have traded in our right to fight for each other, to care for each other, to bring hope and peace and love to this world. For a sermon, a few membership classes, and a tax-deductible giving statement. We've forgotten what it means to give of ourselves, to share ourselves. And we have settled for a one-hour program on Sunday morning. Have we traded what it means to be brother, the bride of Christ, the light of the world, the firstborn, for a collection of lights and buildings, logos and marketing, and safe, neat services? We say we love God. We call ourselves the church. I have a feeling that we've squandered. 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 Our birthright. So what do we do about it? So what do we do about it? So what do we do about it? Do we sit silently pretending nothing is wrong because this is tradition? This is the way that we've always done it. Do we refuse to change the culture because the problem seems too big? Because it will make us uncomfortable? Because it will cost us more of ourselves? If we, the church, want to change the world, we have to change the church. I used to think I was just young, merely idealistic and naive. I used to think that one voice could not make a difference. But what if it can? 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 What if we welcome each other because of our hope for the future instead of the merit in our past? What if our worship becomes a conscious, active, essential part of our daily life instead of a four-course song set and a special offertory piece? What if we give of our time, our resources, our hearts to make a difference in our community instead of writing a check just to clear our conscience? What if we simplify our understanding and belief about the church? What if we actually invest ourselves into building real relationships with those around us? And take ownership of our relationship with God. But what if we're not... What if we're not satisfied with... Satisfied with going to church. What if we're not satisfied with going to church, but strive to become the church? If someone asked you to describe church just using the Bible, like you're not allowed to use any of your experiences, just use the Bible and explain church to them, what would you say? Okay, well, we've got to start with that. We have to start with God's Word. Otherwise, we're going to start creating these things that we like or we want and go, well, I want this in a church. I want this in a church. And we could spend our whole life getting good at that even, but it would be almost like making a great bowl of spaghetti and then coming out of your life and God going, I ordered steak. I ordered something completely different. So what does the Word of God say about the church? I've been asking people this question. Describe church just using the Bible. And four things keep coming up. The number one thing is love. They would say it's a group of people, they're like a 
family. They're so in love with one another. They care for one another. They meet one another's needs. It's like what's mine is yours. If I hurt, you hurt. It's just this body of people. Second thing that people say uh, from the scriptures is it seems like it was a group of people that just had to get this message out. Like they were on a mission. There are people who do not know about Jesus. So this group assembled to figure out how are we going to get this message out to them. The third thing that they, they brought up was it seems like they gathered. And when they gathered, they were focused on the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Like communion was a big deal and they were devoted to praying for one another, fellowshipping with one another and learning this book. And then the fourth thing that they would bring up is it seems like there was an equipping or a training that took place. Like there were leaders in the church that actually instructed the other people on how to do ministry, equip them for working, equip them for serving the Lord. And everyone has this gift. And so the leaders equip them to do those things. So that's what they're saying is church. And I would agree when I look at the Bible, I don't know what you see, but I go, man, that's a beautiful picture. That's what I see about the church. And so then, we have to ask ourselves, are we experiencing that? Am I experiencing that in my church? And I don't know what you go through or where you attend church, but in my experiences and the churches I've observed and been a part of, it's rare when I see family. It's rare when I see that love that we were talking about, where you walk in to a gathering and go, I cannot believe how much these people love each other. I mean, if an unbeliever walked in, they'd be shocked going, I've never seen this kind of love. And, and then we can just say, man, that was the Holy Spirit. That's something that God's done in us. But when have you seen that? And then, and then as far as urgency and mission, I don't know if I've ever seen a group of people that just go, okay, we've got to get the word out. We're on this mission. We got to get to all of these people. I mean, is that what you're experiencing in church? Thirdly, with the, with the gatherings, are we really seeing this type of coming together where we're all using our gifts to bless one another, where there's just, just this fellowship with one another and there's this prayer for one another and we're studying the Bible together and we're, we're putting the body and blood of Jesus Christ you know, on the forefront and, and, and really celebrating that with one another as a family. I was going, gosh, it doesn't seem like there's that type of participation in the church. It, it feels more like going to the movies rather than going to the gym. You know, it's, it's sit back and let them do it versus, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give to this and I'm going to leave feeling great because I put effort into this. And then as far as training, most of the churches I've been a part of, it, it feels like we're trying to recruit leaders rather than develop them and send them out. And it just seems like, man, how can we get this person? How can we gather all these people here rather than having that family mentality where we go, I'm going to raise my kids for 18 years. And then when they turn 18, I want them to be able to go out there, start their own jobs, eventually start their own families, take care of themselves. Instead in the church, it's more like, hey, you know, I want my kids to live in my house for the rest of my life. It's like, no, we got to put that pressure on them. We got to train up these leaders, all these sheep that God's given you. The goal is let me raise them to stand on their own two feet and even start their own ministries. And so when we looked at the shortcomings of church experiences that we had, we said, you know, something has to change. It's not optional. And it's not like we have all these answers now. It's just saying we've got to experiment. We've got to just try something different. Maybe there's something in the way that we structure that, that would enable us to prioritize the things we see in Scripture. This has to be done. It has to change. So we said, okay, let's start a church. Let's start a new church. But let's put aside all those assumptions that we started with last time. Like when we start a church, we usually assume that means we need a preacher, a good preacher, right? How, how do you start a church without that? We need a building. We need a guy that leads a few songs. We need a, a youth pastor. We need a children's pastor. You know, we go down this, this road and go, okay, no, I don't see that in here. What do we need to start with? We need to start with people who are followers of Jesus who say, you know what? 
we will love one another like a family and we will focus on this mission of getting the message of Jesus Christ and spreading his love to those who don't know it and you know what we are going to gather to to train one another up to build one another up so that we can go out and really obey this word and so by doing that we said okay let's be careful not to get distracted by these other things and what do we want to do what is the form that this church is going to take and one of the first things we decided was let's meet in homes let's meet in homes because this will enable us to actually know each other care for each other and live like a family let's let's let's, let's meet in house this will also keep us from getting distracted by salaries because you can shepherd 10 to 20 people without a salary. You can work a full-time job and all we're saying is build into three or four people who will in turn build into three or four people. And so we're not distracted by that. We're not distracted by a building. You know, we have homes, so let's use those and let's just focus on loving each other. Success is how much did we practically love each other throughout the week. Second thing we decided was let's only be together for a year maximum okay so six months from a year from now we'll split into two churches and you're gonna hate it you're gonna hate when we multiply because we're gonna be so in love with each other with each other but for the sake of the mission if we don't just determine we're gonna divide and and multiply we're gonna want to stay together forever and we'll become this ingrown church and we'll just be about each other and not about the mission that God called us to and so it puts this great pressure of uh, you know what, I've got to be prepared. We're going to be dividing and multiplying and reaching the rest of the people. Third thing we decided was, let's read through the Bible together. Let's read through the Bible in a year. We'll read the same passages every day. And what this causes is now the focus is on the word itself rather than a messenger. Now when Sunday comes, we've already talked throughout the week about the passages that we studied. And so Sunday, you, you don't have this dire need for 45 minutes of instruction. Feed me everything I can from the Bible. I've already studied it for myself. I've learned to study and, and I've fellowshiped over it. So now we can share what we've learned. And so we can just give a, a short little teaching and spend the majority of our time on Sundays praying for each other, really expecting results, and, and celebrating the Lord's, Lord's Supper together. Let's, let's prioritize, and God wanted us to get together just to remember His Son, and, and we can fellowship and share a meal together. It's that type of gathering. And then the fourth thing that we decided is, okay, let's start training leaders. We have to because six months a year from now, we, we gotta have two of these. And so let's, let's start raising up leaders, let's teach theology to the key guys who are gonna spread out and, and lead their own church. Let's prepare them as, as, as men of God, as, as elders, and get them out there. And so it's that type of mindset where we're producing leaders and, and we're gathering together in this way and we're learning theology as we're doing ministry. And it's been a, it's been a great process. Uh, not, not that we, we have everything figured out, but it's been an amazing process. And, and a lot of this sprung up because I, I was a pastor for 17 years at one church. It was something we started in the home. And man, I tell you, it's one of the greatest experiences of my life. What an amazing season. We saw God do great things. And I was in love with that group of people. And, and we, a lot was done, so much fruit. But we also saw that there were limitations. And the larger we got, there was concern about, wow, is this the most effective way to use God's resources? I mean, when, when there were 20 people and we multiplied it by to 200, I go, man, that was great to see that type of growth come from those 20 people to 200 or 200 to 2,000. But when, when we had 4,000 people and we reached maybe you know 100 or 200, now we're going, okay, is this the most efficient way? Is there a way to do church that would resemble more like the church in China, where without buildings, without salaries, they were able to multiply in these homes and grow to an estimated over 100 million people? It's like, okay, could that same type of format happen here? And what, could we even do it in a way that it's more biblical and, and more, more love, more mission, more 
fellowship and the right attraction to the gathering, you know, and a multiplication of leaders, we believe it can happen. And again, I'm not saying, hey, this is the way to do it. I'm just saying this is something we've been pursuing. We've been loving it. And I believe we're going to spend the rest of our lives pursuing this dream. I want to talk to you this morning about His church. I want to talk to you about the true church of Jesus Christ. What is the true church of Jesus Christ? We hope after today you'll have no questions on this matter. I don't have all the answers, but I have enough to convince you, I think, what I believe to be the living church of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for the love of Jesus for your manifestation, Lord, in our presence, in our midst. Lord, without you, we have no church. We have no meeting. We have no gathering. And I pray, Lord, that you open my understanding so that I can present to this people your heart and your mind on this matter. Lord Jesus, quicken me. Lord, you gave this to me in prayer. I didn't get it from a book. I got it, Lord, from your heart. And I pray, Lord, that you minister life through what I speak this morning. Open our eyes to the meaning of your church. Let us examine our hearts this morning to see if we are really members of your body. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. He also said that no weapon formed against it should prosper. But you look around now and you see that the gates of hell are prospering. They're prospering against Many churches, the man churches, I call them, they are prevailing. The weapons of the enemy are prevailing. And the word prevail there means to overpower, to defeat. And you see that in a church that is really not acknowledged by God as his own church. The church by no means is a denomination. Now, denominations were caused when certain groups of Christians gathered around a pet doctrine. The Baptists gathered around the Calvinistic doctrine of eternal security. The Pentecostals gathered around the doctrine of an infilling of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. The Seventh-day Adventists gathered around the doctrine about the Seventh-day Sabbath, or the Sabbath being Saturday. You find uh, the Wesleyan Methodists gathered around the doctrine of entire sanctification, and on and on and on. Until there were divisions because people gathered around not the, not the person of Jesus Christ as much as the doctrine. And they got, they gathered around those doctrines and then they began to split up and reform. There's reform movement after reform movement after reform movement having to do with people gathering around the doctrine. And so you have 50 kinds of Baptists now. You've got 100 kinds of Pentecostals. You've got all kinds of charismatic and non-denominational churches by the multiplied thousands and division everywhere you look. This was never God's idea from the beginning. Entire denominations now have been overpowered by the weapons of Satan. The gates of hell have prevailed against entire denominations where pastors no longer believe the Bible to be the inerrant word of God. They no longer believe in the virgin birth. They don't believe in a heaven or a hell. They, they call evil good and good evil. This is being overpowered. What else can you call it but the gates of hell prevailing when the seminaries of many of these denominations have uh, teachers and professors there who do everything to demean the gospel, everything to discredit the miracles of Jesus Christ, to take away his Godhead, and the hell bent professors that are hell-bent in destroying what little faith that our young people have left. If that is not being overpowered by the enemy, I don't know what is. But you see, God has discounted all of that man calls church. It's never been a part of his church. Really not been his. It's been man's, but it's never been his. He doesn't acknowledge it. In his eyes, it doesn't even exist. That which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination to God. Absolutely. God has never acknowledged it as his own church. But I also believe that many Christians are misinformed about the meaning of the church. They really don't understand what the church of Jesus Christ is. 
And I say that because of the way we measure the success of the church today. We have mega churches, we've got super churches, we've got fastest growing churches. And we look at these beautiful multi-million dollar buildings, we look at the wonderful 30, 40, 50 acre campuses, and we see churches packed with thousands, and we say, God must be there. That must be God's church. Look, their finances, they have money in the bank, they have multitudes coming. That must be a very successful church. Jesus must be at work in that church. But folks, I'm so glad to inform you that that is not God's measure of success. You can have multiplied thousands in church, you can have a burgeoning budget, you can have all of these things and Jesus not be in the building. Jesus not even acknowledge it that it's His. Highly esteemed among men, very successful, popular, accepted, but abomination in the eyes of God. A minister friend of mine recently uh, told, told me he was filling out his application for uh, every year you, you fill out uh, a form <clears throat> to continue your ordination and he was filling out his form and suddenly it hit him like a sword in his heart he said there's nothing on this application at all that has to do with a spiritual measurement the questions were like this how many are attending your Sunday school how many attend Sunday night? How many do you have in your prayer meeting? How many Boy Scouts do you have in your, in your boys program? How many women attend your women's auxiliary? And uh, give us the percentage of increase in your numbers and in your finances. What's the per capita giving per each person? There was not one spiritual question in the whole uh, application. He said, you know, I could have been a reprobate and filled out this question and still keep my ordination. Because there's no measure of my spirituality. There wasn't a question about how I was doing with the Lord. Anything about my burden for the Lord. Nothing about my morals. Nothing about my family or my vision. Nothing at all. And, and that's typical of almost every denomination. He said there was nothing spiritual about it all. He said, I was, I was suddenly shocked at how far we've gone from understanding the true church of Jesus Christ. It's an amazing thing. Now let me tell you what I believe constitutes his church. This is what I believe constitutes his church. And there are required features that distinguish his church from every other thing that is called church. Folks, before you leave this service this morning, I hope you understand what the church of Jesus Christ is. We have the pattern in the 20th chapter of John. Go to John, the 20th chapter, if you will, please. Quickly, 20th chapter of John. I'm going to start reading at verse 18. This is the first gathering of the church that Jesus is going to build. Now, folks, remember that <clears throat> Moses built a house. Moses had a church, and the Bible said he was faithful in his house. But the Bible, the Lord goes on to say, Jesus said, I will build my house. The church of Jesus Christ did not exist until after his resurrection. And he said, I will build my house. The scripture is about Christ as a son over his own house. He, he said, I will build it. And he's starting to build it right here. You're going to see the first meeting of the church of Jesus Christ. You're going to see all the features that should be in what is called his church. They're all in this first meeting. Remember, these are living stones. He's building a church, and this is the foundation. These are the foundation stones in this first meeting. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace unto you. When he had so said, he showed them his hands in his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father sent me, even so send I you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whoso, whosoever sins ye remit, they're remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Now look this way if you will please. He's building his church, and all the features of the church from now to Jesus comes, you'll find it right here. And I want to go over it with you 
as simply as I know how. In this first gathering, <clears throat> you have the making and the birth of the true church of Jesus Christ. And first of all, his church is comprised of individual believers who have a special love relationship with Jesus Christ. Every single one of these who are gathered here have their own special revelation of Christ. He's revealed himself individually to them and every one of them are devoted. They have given up careers. He is not just first in their life. He's everything in their life. The church of Jesus Christ is comprised of individuals who are wholly given to Christ. He has become their life. He's not a part of life. He is their life. He's the focus. He's the center. Now, that's where the church begins. It's comprised of individuals wholly given to him with their own revelation of who he is. With their own hearts burning for the word of God. Now, let's consider those that are gathered in this meeting. One of the accounts by John, it says there were 11. Luke's, Luke implies that there were many, many more in this first meeting. No doubt Nicodemus, uh, no doubt the rich man Joseph, uh, Joseph of Arimathea. The Bible makes it clear that the two disciples at Emmaus were there. Remember, they had their own revelation. They were so devoted to him and they had a revelation because Jesus appeared to them and opened up the scriptures regarding himself. Peter was there to whom the Lord had shown himself. They had all had some kind of revelation of him. They had seen the empty tomb. There was a revelation of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Every one of them. Mary of Bethany was probably there. Lazarus. They're all gathered and every one of these the thing that identifies them, that individually they had their own experience with him. They had their own revelation of Jesus. They didn't get it from somebody else. It was their own. And Mary Magdalene comes knocking on the door and she said, I've seen him. And this gathering was not a pastor up there trying to reveal Christ to a congregation. That's not the church. The church says that every member of that congregation came there with revelation. Their own experience with Christ. They saw him. They talked to him. They had the word burning in their hearts. And so at this first meeting, it is not Peter standing up admonishing them about what they, he had seen of Christ. It's first of all the woman who Jesus had cast seven devils out of. Probably a prostitute at one time. And she is the one that's saying, Pastor, I saw him. I talked to him. The two disciples, unknown disciples, I believe many of the 70 chosen disciples were there, uh, that Jesus sent out, were also in the meeting. And they were all excited. Every one of them were telling what they saw and heard of Jesus. This was an excited group. They came to church not to hear about Christ. They had heard of Christ. They brought Christ with them. This is the church of Jesus Christ. Individuals who have had their own experience, their own revelation of the reality, their own intimacy with Jesus Christ, the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, what a wonder that in the midst of apostasy, rejection of Christ and every all offers of His grace, that's right in the middle of Jerusalem, in the middle of the... Darkness in the middle of the rejection of Christ, the Lord had a body totally devoted to him. And folks, I'm telling you, even now in this day of gross darkness, in this day when Christ is being rejected, when they're trying to throw him out of our society and out of our courts, they don't even want his name mentioned. Thank God around the world, even in, in the communist countries, all over the world, Jesus has a body. He has a devoted people, individuals, their own revelation of Christ. The church is alive and well. Hallelujah. Now listen to me closely. It is this devotion, this personal individual devotion of Jesus Christ, which is the bond of the body of Christ. I, I travel, and when I go to another country, and I walk a street, and, and I don't understand the language, and somebody will, will say, hello, thinking, or I, I must look like an American, so they give me a little bit of their American language, and I understand, they'll, they'll be speaking English. He said, uh, where are you from? I said, New York. New York. <coughs> yes, and, and, and I'm a pastor there. Oh, you're Christian? Yes. 
uh, what church? Times Square. Oh, I've heard of that. Praise God. I'm a charismatic, just like you. And, and, and you said, well, you met the body of Christ. You met another. No, 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 not necessarily. Because it only takes about 10 minutes before you find out where that man's heart is. That man's heart, he's talking about his exotic vacation. He's talking about everything but Jesus. The devotion is not there. And suddenly you pull back and say, I'm not one with this man. You can go to Japan and you can walk around and you find a little prayer group and they're, they're, they're praising the Lord. And you walk in and say, I found the church. I found the body. These people love Jesus. But then the pastor gets up and you know he's not been alone with God. There's no devotion. It's all flesh. And suddenly you, know, you thought you found the church. It wasn't the church at all. It wasn't there because the bond is not there. Folks, you meet the church anywhere on earth where you find an individual that is totally voted to Jesus Christ. And if they are, you'll know it very quickly and shortly and the bond will be there. We here talk about the church being united. Let, 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 let's unite the church. Let's everybody get together. Folks, you don't have to. It's already together. It's all in Christ. He's the head. We're the body. It has always been together. It's never been divided. Never. If you, if, if Jesus could come and, and take you on a flying carpet trip over the, the America, around the world, and you say, Jesus, show me the church. And he would take you into the atmosphere, so to speak. And, and, and you look at the, he takes you to hover over a great church of 5,000 people and say, Lord, show me your church. And he said, all right, you see the woman over here and see this one over here. And he'll pick up maybe 10 or 12. So that's my church. These are my devoted ones. But Lord, what about those thousands there that are singing love songs to you? He said, my heart, they don't have a heart for me. They, I, I, am, I am just a word to them. It's just deed. It's, it's just word and it's not in deed. They don't love the truth. They don't spend any time with me. That is not my church. They don't have the devoted heart. I wonder how many of you we could point out this morning and say to his angelic host, See that sister? See that brother? See this one over here? This one over here? Look how hungry they are for me. I've been te teaching them, speaking them to the years, and they're still hungry. They give me precious time. They give me quality time. My heart. I am not just something laying easy on the back roads of their mind. I am the center of their life. I am everything to them. This is my church. Hallelujah. Secondly, his church is comprised of devoted individual believers whose greatest joy is to assemble with others who share that devotion. It's called the body of Christ. They don't have to be warned, forsake not the summing of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Because... There is something of the Holy Spirit that draws every devoted believer to the body. Now let me say this clear and simply, but right to the point and listen to it, please. The church is not complete without the corporate expression. Because God reveals himself, Christ reveals himself in the corporate body in ways he cannot reveal himself individually to you. Or to me. For example, the gifts. How, how, how do you operate the gifts on yourself? What about the love of God that shed abroad? Not just on me, but abroad. What about the joy and excitement of watching your brothers and sisters grow in the Lord and in their growth you get faith and hope? There's a shared revelation in the assembly. Everyone that was gathered in this first meeting, though they had their own private, glorious revelation of who Jesus is, they had seen him, they'd talked to him, they'd been with him three years, but now they're gathered together and they're going to experience a special manifestation of Jesus that could not have come individually to them. Now keep in mind that just a few days before these disciples had fled from his presence at the first sign of danger. They all forsook him and fled. But now 
fearlessly they meet in a clandestine fashion because they are taking literally now something the Holy Spirit has reminded them that Jesus said to them. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. Now, folks, they didn't take that as a promise, but as a consequence. Now, listen closely, please. God's been speaking so clearly in my heart this. It was not just a promise. That's a consequence. He's, he said, if, if you will meet in my name, and you know what needs to meet in his name? Let everyone who names the name of Jesus depart from iniquity. It means these have departed from iniquity. They're not living in sin, wholly devoted to Jesus Christ, and they're meeting in his name. And the Lord said, you meet under those conditions, and there I am. Doesn't say, I will come. Doesn't say you have to fast or pray or beg or plead and wait till I come. That is the consequence of you coming in divine order. The consequence of it, the result of it, is that I'm there. And they thought, well, if he said there are two or three, we better get together. Because we want him to appear. We want to see him again. So it was, they assembled together and they shut the door. And it was just as they were told. Jesus came and stood in their midst. Verse 19, Jesus came and stood in their midst. Folks, there is no church. It is not a church. Unless Jesus is standing in the midst of it. Unless there is a manifestation of his presence. If in every service Jesus is not there, it's not the church. They're not meeting in his name properly. You, you say, well, brother, can't we enjoy his presence alone as individuals? Why do I need the church? I have a lot of people say, well, I just worship alone, just me and Jesus. Well, he does manifest his presence to those that are shut in with him. The scripture says, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and I will love him and manifest myself to him as, as an individual. I'll manifest myself to you. Because you see, sometimes there is an imposed isolation. L look at... Paul in, in prison, he, he has isolation imposed upon him. And say with John and Isle of Patmos, isolation is imposed upon him. Sometimes you're sick and by yourself it's imposed upon you. That's a different thing because in those conditions, when it's impo isolation is imposed upon you by conditions or forces outside your control, then the Lord reveals himself in a very unique way. That's where Paul got his revelation for the church. And same with John and Isle of Patmos. What a revelation of Jesus. When John said, I saw him standing among the candlesticks. It, it was in an isolation alone with the Lord. That's only when it's imposed, when it's beyond your power. But folks, when you just stay at home watching TV, there's no imposed isolation upon you. You, you, you are drawing away from the very source of the glory of the Lord. But you see... There's a reason why Jesus manifests himself to us. And I want you to listen to this, please. Jesus comes to manifest himself to us that we may have life and his power. His very life is energy, it is power. But life is given for a purpose. And that's that we may be useful to him, useful to the body. The Bible said, and the life was light. You can have power without any knowledge of how to use it. That's the light. The life became the light. In other words, he doesn't give you power just, just to spin and waste it. Let me give you an example. You take a 200 what, 200 amp diesel fired <coughs> generator. Now, you put diesel in it and you start it up. It's got 200 amps of power. It's got energy. It's got life. And it, 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 as long as you give it its individual source of energy, if you keep pouring the diesel in it, it'll, it'll keep turning. It'll keep putting out energy. But it's of no use. It's not hooked up to any need. It's just wasting its energy. But then you look at the house. And the house has no energy, it has no light, the lights aren't working, the stove is not working, there's no heat. And you hook it up, you hook the generator up and suddenly the lights go on. Now the generator is useful. 
You say, I'm alone with Jesus, I'm getting revelation, I'm getting power from the Lord, I'm getting life. But I'm telling you, if you're not hooked up to the body of Christ, if you're not a part of the body of Jesus Christ, you're that generator that's wasting its energy. You have to be connected. Pick up this week's Life magazine, the November issue, and you'll see uh, an incredible sight. There's a, a man's arm and forearm laying disconnected on the operating table. It's a 13-hour operation that was accomplished by a businessman named Clint in 1989 in, in an accident with a chainsaw. He severed his arm. And now after, two, uh, after this time, the doctors uh, severed the arm of a brain-dead man. <clears throat> and they are trans... They're now hooking this arm to this man, and it's a 13-hour operation. Now, that arm is there. It's still got blood in it, and they've got a pump there, and it's got probably a 13 to 16-hour lifespan, but it's got to be hooked up. The arm is there, but the fingers are not moving. There are no nerves. It's an arm. It's got blood in it, but it's useless. But they hooked him up. for the. This is the second operation of its kind, and they connected the arm, and yesterday I was listening to the radio and it said that it's been successful, that he feels the nerves and the fingers are moving. Now the arm is what? It's useful. You see, if you're not connected to the body, I don't care how much revelation you get, I don't care how much time you spend alone, you are severed from the body. And you're going to have to have, you're going to be hooked up to some artificial kind of life. And you're of no use. You're going to lay on that operating table. That's a hand. It's got blood in it. It's got a form of life. But it's no good to anybody. It's useless. Folks, that's what the body of Jesus Christ, we are arm of his arm. We are bone of his bone. We are flesh of his flesh. We are connected to the head. And you can only get that in a corporate experience of the assembly. Reaching together, worshiping together in Him. Are you beginning to understand it? Now let's go a step further. It's not enough just to be quickened by the presence of Jesus. It's not enough <clears throat> to be just doing things, <clears throat> being useful... You, that usefulness has to be subject to his will. If, if, you know, you can, you can be hooked up to the arm, but you still have to get your directions from the head. And in this meeting, I want you to notice this. Jesus comes in and the first thing is peace. And that's what you get, first of all, when the body of Jesus Christ, when devoted people get together to worship the Lord as the body. The first thing you get is the overflowing of the peace of Christ. The peace of God. Folks, I get that every time I walk into this church. I sit down there, peace. Absolute peace. But folks, he can give you peace and you not value it or not have an expression of it, not know it in its fullness. And you don't get that until you see the fullness of the body. And I'll show it to you in just a minute how you not only are given the gift of peace from Christ... But you have to have that peace flowing in and through you. And I'll show you in a few minutes how that will happen. But you see, <clears throat> Jesus, after he gives peace, he said, As I was sent to the world, so send I you. And this is the first instruction they get. And this is the instruction you get in the corporate body of Jesus Christ. The Lord said, you know that I escaped. You saw me escaping to prayer. I, you, you saw me leave you and go to the mountains. You saw that I prayed. I was getting my instructions from the Heavenly Father. He said, I did not operate on human compassion. Remember the man that came to him and said, Master, uh, mediate between me and my brother. Help cause him. Get my brother to share his inheritance rightly with me. And Jesus said, Man, who made me? your divider or your lawyer. And what he's saying, I don't do anything except what my father tells me. That was human need. 
Jesus had compassion on the, me, on the man, but he never allowed his compassion to get him out of the parameters of the will of God. And when you do that, when the presence of Jesus is not in a church where people are not praying over everything and getting their direction from the Spirit of the living God, then you find men running around trying to change the world in their own energy. They sweat, they get tired, and everybody's worn out. And then they wind up saying, is this all there is to it? Jesus didn't move in the realm of human compassion, though he was moved with compassion everywhere he went. He did not operate in the realm of human compassion. And folks, the church of Jesus Christ that starts only picketing and demonstrating. Folks, when the movie opened up, or rather the play opened up here, Corpus Christi, on Tuesday night, this church got a hold of God. That is just six blocks from here. And that's the play where Jesus is called a homo, Jesus is depicted as a homosexual. And in the play, he plants a kiss on Judas, his lover. And he has an affair with all his 12 disciples. A homosexual affair. And folks, we prayed in this church. We sought God because our weapons and our carnal, but mighty through God in the pulling down of strongholds. Then after the service, I went over there. And there were about 2,000 demonstrators. There were, there, were, there were statues of the Virgin Mary. There were all kinds of placards. And, and, and uh, people were there. And, and you know, there was... I said to a brother who was with me, I said, you know, that 15 minutes of prayer at Times Square Church accomplished more against this than all the demonstrating here tonight by the hundreds. I'm not putting that down, but the church does not move in human compassion. It moves through direction of Jesus Christ himself. And he said to these Gathered in that first meeting as I was sent, so send I you. Total dependence. Total dependence. Hallelujah. The church does not operate independent. It does not go out just to meet human need because it's there. It operates in the parameters, the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can be useful, <clears throat> but not subjected to the will of God. It has to be total subjection to his will. Hallelujah. Now, thirdly, in his church, the Holy Spirit is always at work changing people's hearts. Conforming them, convicting them, and conforming them to the nature of the one they're devoted to. In other words, if Jesus is not there, there's no work of the Holy Spirit in changing lives. Nobody is really changed without the manifest presence of Jesus in the midst. Jesus came into the midst and he breathed on them and a very special work of the Holy Spirit was suddenly announced. Now, folks, I want you to fasten your seat belts because I'm going to take you on a little trip here. I'm going to show you the heart of the church. <clears throat> Jesus stands in the midst. And in the 20th chapter, verse 22, when he said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. How many see that? Receive ye the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> Folks, look at me, please. He's now building his church. He's laying the foundation there's got to be a special breathing of the Holy Spirit for them to accomplish something they can't accomplish in their flesh. And what he's really saying, look, I'm going to be sending you out. I'm going to be sending you out in the world and you are going to be mocked and you are going to be scoffed as my witnesses. You're, you're devoted to me. You want to do my will? Yes. But you're going to be persecuted, misunderstood, and beaten and stoned. And you're going to be called all kinds of names as the offscouring of the world. Your flesh will want to retaliate. You're going to want to fight back. You want to defend yourself. He said, and even your brothers and sisters, those who are supposed to be religious, those who are supposed to be devoted, those who are supposed to be brothers and sisters in me, he said, they're going to hurt you. They're going to wound you. You're going to have people trample over you. And he said, I'm, I'm going to breathe on you now with an expression of the Holy Ghost you're going to need because what I'm going to ask of you now, you can't do it in human strength. 
You're going to need the breathing of the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm going to ask you to do something that is absolutely impossible. And folks, this is the real heart. This is the real manifestation of the church of Jesus Christ. This is what the witness is. This is, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost comes upon you. You know, when I was a young preacher, almost all my young preacher friends were just like me. I, Lord, give me the power. I'd go in hospitals and raise a dead. I want the power that I can lay hands on every sick person. I'm going to go in the hospital and clear it out. <laughs> and all we, we've had evangelists advertise men of power. And that power was zapping people. That power was all, all kinds of demonstrations. That's supposed to be power. No, 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 no. You shall be witnesses after that you've received the power of the Holy Ghost. Folks, what is the witness? Jesus makes it very clear. There's a scripture here that most of us have just skipped over because we're afraid to face it. We don't understand it. It's in verse 22. And I want you to notice verse 23 is, or verse 23 is hooked to 22. You go from 22, and that's a continuation of verse 22. Receiving the Holy Ghost, whosoever sins ye remit, they're remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they're retained. Do you see it? Are you ready to face it? You want to know what that means? You know, of course, only God can forgive sins. You know there has to be repentance and faith. So that's beyond your ability and mine. Now, the Catholic Church has taken that literally is, is, is to mean that the priest in the confession booth has the power to remit sins. Not so. Not so at all. The remitting of the sin referred to is the sin against you. It's the sin against me. It's my brother, my sister, or any enemy who comes against me and defiles me or tries to tear me down, mocks me, ridicules me, hurts me. He said, whosoever sins, he's talking about forgiveness. Jesus wants to be manifested. He wants to be told by him. He wants the whole world to know that there are witnesses to his loving, forgiving power who is always ready to forgive. Folks, you can go out in the street corner and you can yell all the scriptures you want. You can call that fire. You can call that the Holy Ghost. Call it anything you want. You can stand and have a healing line and thousands of people be touched. But if you've got a grudge in your heart and you're not remitting somebody's sin against you, you have no power. This is God's call to release the sin of the brother or sister who sinned against you. And the Lord is saying, now they'll answer for their sin against me. They'll answer for all the sins against grace. But on this one issue, the sin against you, you must release it. You remit it. Folks, Jesus set the example on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. He's saying, Father, no matter what they have to answer for, for their own personal sins, or sins against you, or grace, on this one matter against me, I release them. And on the judgment day, not one of those sinners, not one of those soldiers, not one of those priests will answer for that. Because the Father said, I'll remit it. Now, there are times that you can't remit because when somebody sins and the church has said, it's told, commanded to take elders and speak to that individual. And then if they won't listen, bring them to the church. And if those people are set on not being reconciled, there is no repentance. Even though the love of Christ is shown them, the scriptures given to them, then the Bible says you can't, you can't release that. Remember Stephen being stoned. He said, Father, lay not this to their charge. He's saying, I remit the sins of these, all that are stoning me now. What about those that have stoned you? The church of Jesus Christ is a house where there's no vengeance. It's a house where there every devoted child of Jesus Christ has released from their heart, from the book of life or rather from the book of sins in heaven, they have asked God to release those sins. 
Folks, when God began to deal with me on this last few weeks, He's had me on my knees, naming everybody that I felt has hurt me in my lifetime. Everyone who's ever harmed me, everyone who's trampled on me, everyone said anything about me. I've had to say, Jesus, I forgive them. I remit their sins. Father in heaven, now you clean it. I release them. And when I released them, he released me. And that's when you know the peace of God. The house of Jesus Christ is a house of people who have forgiven everybody. There's no grudge. There's no sign of vengeance. There's no hurt left. Some of you here now have not released somebody who's hurt you. Somebody in your family, a former husband, a former wife, somebody has hurt you and you're not releasing them. You're holding it. You're full of it. That's not the church. That's not his body. When the Holy Ghost is at work in a church, he's doing just what, he'll do just what he's doing now by his loving power. He will show you the sin of unforgiveness. If you're going to have the power of the Holy Ghost, I, I, there, there, there's an evangelist, God bless his heart. <clears throat> he, he, he has healing lines and rather well known and Boy, boy, does he preach, but he writes me the vicious letters, hateful letters. I had to release him. I love the man. I pray for him. I have nothing but love for that man. But you see, if I let that get in my spirit, I lose the peace that Jesus gave me. He said he breathed peace on me, and I can't enjoy it because I got this in my heart. Folks, if you, you can have peace all over you, given by God and then gifted by the Holy Ghost, not enjoy a bit of it because of what's in your heart. The church of Jesus Christ is a church that has remitted the sins. I don't care if on the job your boss has cursed you. I don't care what happens on your job and all those around you. You are to forgive them. Those who despitefully use you, you're to love them. And not only forgive them, pray for them. And the only way you can love your enemies is to be praying for them. Now, <clears throat> give you a... <clears throat> Do you see how important it is to have the presence of Jesus in the house? <clears throat> let, me, let me wrap this up for you. Why would you ever stay in a place where Jesus wasn't there? Why would you go to a house where he doesn't show up? Where there's no breathing of the Holy Spirit? Paul tells us that the church of man, not the church of Jesus Christ, but the church of man, the church where there's no manifestation of the presence of Jesus is a house of vain babblings. In other words, meaningless worship, empty words. And he said, oh, Timothy, avoid profane and vain babblings. Stay away from it. Paul, the scripture says that when you put leaven in a lump, it leavens the whole lump. And if there is leaven, where there's not the presence of the Lord, there is leaven. And you say, I'm going to go there. I, I know it's not, I'm not getting fed and I know the presence of the Lord is really not there, but I've got to go to church. Be careful. You're not leavened in that lump. Furthermore, Paul goes a step further. He said about these vain babblings, they lead to an increase in ungodliness. You'll find that in 2 Timothy 2.16. Because if you sit under a ministry that is not saturated with the presence of Jesus, not according to the mind of God, you're going to have error, and that is going to lead you to ungodliness. You're going to allow things in your life you never thought you would allow, because you don't know, but it's being dripped into your spirit, and it's changing you. Now, folks, I, I'm not trying, this is not a commercial with Times Square Church, because we don't have any seats left. Folks, it's more serious than that. Paul said very clearly, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, useful 
to the master and prepared for every good work. That word purge right there, the only time it's used as it is, is to remove yourself. Remove yourself from this spirit. Remove yourself from that kind of thing. Remove yourself. Folks, I have hundreds of thousands on my mailing list, as I've told you. And probably the number one complaint of all the Christians who write to us, they say, Pastor, I can't find a church where I feel the presence of the Lord. My church is dead. What am I going to do? You might be in a place where you, you say, I can't find a church that's, that's uh, really right. Folks, if, if you're going to a church that is spiritually dead and you know Jesus is not there, the Spirit of the Lord is not at work. There's no breathing of His life. Get out of it. Get out of it. Leave it. It's that simple. Paul makes it clear. I'm on good scriptural ground. He said, purge yourself of this so that you can be a useful, sanctified vessel, meet for the master's use. He said, isolate yourself from that foolishness. But then you say, well, where am I going to find it? Let me, let me give you something the Holy Spirit gave me just last night. The same spirit that's moving on you, making you disgusted with the death that you see. The same spirit that's awakening you, saying, I want more, I need more. I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I want to grow in the Lord. I want to be in an atmosphere where the presence of the Lord is real. The same spirit that's doing that in you, he never does it in an isolated form. He does that wherever he's working on one. He's got to work on two or three more. And the same spirit that's working on you, the Lord told me, is working on people around you. And if you will just seek him with all your heart and pray diligently about this, say, Lord, lead me to that two or three that are feeling like I do and being moved on the spirit like I am. Lord Jesus, lead me to them. And he will let you be brought miraculously to that body. Because if you're devoted to him, he's going to bring you to the others who are devoted to him. You're going to find the body. He'll bring the body to you and you to the body. And though it may be only two or three get together, get some of our tapes if you want for the preaching. You can worship and pray. You don't need a preacher. I'm not against having pastors or I wouldn't be one. <laughs> but what are you going to be do when you're stuck up someplace in Alaska, in a little village? So, Jesus, surely there somebody in God may send one, maybe two. Wonderful fellowship and prayer. Just talking about Jesus. Somebody told me recently that they were sitting around a, a dining room table, and suddenly everybody just started talking about Jesus, and it was such, they, they said it was church. It was church. Jesus came right to the table because they were, they were talking about him. And, and, and they were there for an hour just talking about Jesus. And suddenly they realized, one person told me, I was in church. That is the church. Hallelujah. I hope you understand a little better the meaning of the church of Jesus Christ. Will you stand, please? While this whole process has been going on, though, understand that as we talk about the future of the church, when we first started pursuing this land on Tierra Hada, the staff, the elders, we realized that the biggest problem that Cornerstone has is not just space, okay? We haven't been able to grow for the last seven years or so, just, uh, just been packed out every service, and, and the, the issue is not really space. There's other things in the church that we believe are bigger problems, um, the bigger problems where we'd look at scripture and the way the church would interact with one another and we're going, we're not living those things out. So why do we want a bigger version of a failure in that sense? You know what I mean? It's, it's like we don't want to get more people together who could care less about each other. You know, what's the point of that? Let's work on 
Let's work on. Does that make sense? You know what I mean? It's. I mean, it look good. You know, it looks like a lot of people. But you know, but but we're just looking at scripture and going, okay, here's the bigger problem. So we'll deal with the land. You know, we had other people working on the land. Let's focus on our church. Let's focus on caring for each other. Let's focus on the things that are mandated by scripture. It was everything that we talked about this last week at the gospel conference. Everything you, you know, Jeff, who spoke last week, and Dave, who spoke uh, last uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. The, their churches and what they're all about is really what we've been focusing on. And it's, it's amazing how we've all come together and got to know each other. But it's this whole idea of caring for one another. And, uh, and the, it's, it's about making the church as biblical as possible. That's the goal. Okay? It's not making the church as big as possible. Sure, I'd love thousands and thousands of people to come. But uh, that's not the goal. The goal is to become as biblical as possible. And I believe as we do that, people will be attracted to the church and it'll be a light into the world. But to, to start off what I want to say right here, I want to take you back to one of the first lessons I learned in seminary. Um, when they were teaching us how to interpret scripture. It was one of the few things I still remember. Um, but one of the first lessons we taught were, that we were taught were, was, was what the difference between exegesis and eisegesis. Okay, two kind of seminary type words. But I'm gonna throw them on the screen so you know, exegesis. Exegesis is an attempt to discover the meaning of the text objectively. It comes from a Greek word that means to draw out or to lead out. The whole idea is you're taking a text of scripture and you're objectively trying to discover what does this really say? Now, eisegesis is the idea of importing a subjective meaning into the text. Here's what I mean. You can look at the Bible in two different ways. One is you can start with the Bible, and that's exegesis. You start with the Bible, you start with the text, and go, man, what does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? And you try to get the meaning out of it. The other eisegesis, what you don't want to do, is we all have desires, we all have thoughts, we all have wants, you know, we all have traditions, and what we'll do is we'll go into the scripture going, you know what, I think this is true, let me prove it by taking verses out of the Bible to prove my point of view. So you understand the difference? Like, like it's very easy to, 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 you know, the temptation is to do eisegesis. That means, and you can do anything with it. You, you, can, you can proof text anything if you really want to. If you want to get a divorce, you can go, well, you know what? This verse actually uh, could mean this. You want to build a mansion, you go, well, you know what? If you take this one verse here, I could justify this. You want to hate someone, you go, well, you know what, there's this one guy that hate, you can justify anything, that's eisegesis, you have this desire, you start with an idea, and then you pull verses to support it, versus exegesis, which you start with the Bible and go, man, what would I come up with if I started with this? And I could put my feelings, my desires aside, what does this really say? That is exegesis. Now, in seminary, I was taught to teach exegetically. That's why sometimes I'll, like, like right now, we've been teaching through the book of Philippians. And I'm kind of going into Philippians going, okay, whatever it says, let's just do it. Now let's find out what it says. And I don't really have a desire for Philippians. Like, I wanted to say this, or I wanted to, I'm just going, let's just go verse by verse, and whatever it says, that's what I'll teach. And I'm learning every week with you. Here's what it seems like it says. Am I right? Am I crazy? You know, isn't this what it says, even though I don't like it sometimes, even though it doesn't fit with my lifestyle, uh, rather than changing the scriptures, I, I gotta change my lifestyle. And so I try to teach exegetically, and, and the tougher thing is to live exegetically is to say, okay, how would I live if I just read this Bible and I put aside my culture, put aside my desires, put aside what everyone else is doing, and just go, if I started with this, what type of lifestyle would come out from here? And that's very difficult, and that's what we've been trying to do with the church. Let me go ahead and turn that off. Um, interesting, for example, here, let me explain exegesis, eisegesis to you in, in maybe a more tangible way. On Friday, a couple Mormons came to my door, okay? They knocked on my door, and we started talking. We, you'd think they'd have my address, like, on a <laughs> blacklist or something, but they, they, they came to my door, and, you know, and, and two very nice guys come to my door, knock on the door, and we just start talking. We talk for about half an hour, you know? We just engage in a conversation. 
And, and I told them, my struggle is if you started with this, would you ever come up with your belief system? And, and I said, okay, so you believe that God has a father and that that father has a father and he has a father. So there's a great-grandfather God, great-great-great-grandfather God, right? And they said, yes. We believe that there's a whole lineage of them. And I said, okay, and you, so where's grandfather right now? And they go, we're not worried about him. He's somewhere, but we're not worried about him. And I go, okay, and they all became God, like they weren't God to begin with. No, they weren't God to begin with. They became God. Um, and so there's just this lineage. So Jesus became God, and God the Father became God, and you guys are going to become gods. And they're like, yes. And I said, are you gods right now? And they go, no, we're sons of God. And I go, but you believe that you're eternal. I go, so you, were you eternally sons of God? He goes, no, eternally we were just some sort of matter, and then at some point we're given a soul, and then we're given a body, and then we're going to become like God is now. And I said, oh, gosh, that's so hard to get from this book. I go, if I read, just read this book, I would think that God was eternal, that there's just one God that's always been, and that he didn't change, that he was the same yesterday, today, and forever that he always was God, and there's just one. I mean, I would just naturally, like, you, you read, I don't know how you can make it any clearer. And, and I said, so that's my struggle with this. And I, and I said, let's take the issue of even some of the other beliefs that you have. I go, let's take blacks. I go, you guys didn't allow blacks into the priesthood until when? And he said, 1979. I said, because you believed they were cursed by God, right? He goes, yeah, that was the mark of God's curse, was their black skin. And I said, okay, well now, how about, how about me? I, I said, I'm not, I'm not black. I mean, summer, I get pretty dark, you know? I, 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 but, you know, just honestly, I go, seriously, I go, what, what shade of black, you know? And they said, well, any shade. I, I said, so the whiter you are, you know, the more pure. He goes, yeah, any, any, pig, any, any color showed that there was some of that in your background and showed that you were part of those who received this, this curse from God. And I said, and isn't it strange to you that that ban was lifted in 1979, you know, after the, and they're like, no, it makes perfect sense to me. And I go, I go, that's, see, I go, I can't get that. I, I can't get that from here. Like, 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 again, they go, no, you can make it. You, it I, I said, I can't get your, your Book of Mormon and, and mixing this together. He goes, oh, yeah, you can if you could see the big picture. We went into all different issues. I even had my daughter. I said, oh, you know, honey, you got to come listen to this. Because I, no, I, I wanted her to learn. I go, I want you to understand, you know. And, and we're going back and forth. I go, here's my problem is I would never put, I would never just read this and then put it down and go, okay, I, I, I need to become God. I need to, uh, you know, go in the succession and, and, and everything else. I would just think, no, there's this creator who just made me and I just bow down to him. I just worship him and, and this Jesus, it's all about him. And, and I'm not going to become like him one day, you know. There'll, there'll, there'll be, you know, this, this, this sense in which I'm given a new body and this. Yeah, but I, I wouldn't come up with this whole theology if I started with this. Sure, you can take this verse here and this verse here and, and mix it all and, and create this theology, but you'd never if you started this way. It was no similar, it, it was no different than... Um, uh, some Jehovah's Witnesses that came to my door. Um, and, and when they were, I, I go, here's my struggle. I go, again, and you guys, I, I go, man, I, I like you guys. I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to, I'm not trying to be facetious here or whatever else. I'm just trying to understand how you think. I go, because you guys are teaching that, that Jesus is, is one of the archangels. You know, you're, you're teaching that Jesus is, is the same person as Michael, the archangel in the, in the Old Testament? And, and explain, but, but Michael was just one of the chief princes. And, and then showed him Daniel 10, 13, where it says that Michael was one of the chief princes. And he goes, well, I never noticed that. I go, well, now that you notice, I mean, what does that do? I go, here again. My point is not, here, let me show you this, or let me question this one detail about your theology. My, my point is, is you'd never open this book, read it from cover to cover 20 times, and go, you know what? Jesus is Michael the archangel. You'd never get that. Seriously, it's, it's not like something that's going to, 
that's not what you're going to get, just like you're not going to get, you know, the, the whole succession of gods and on and on and on. That's not what you would come to. What, is, what, is, what would you come to through exegesis, through reading this book and just going, okay, what's the truth? See, and I told him, look, you, you guys grew up, I go, I, I feel bad for you. You grew up in a system. You were told this way, and I can't imagine how hard it would be for you tonight to get by yourself, not even the two of you together, just alone with God. I don't think you really believe this when you're alone. And I said that, I, I go, I can't imagine you really do before the Holy Spirit, before the scriptures, just you alone. Could you please just consider getting alone and reading this book and studying this book and, and being open to the Holy Spirit saying, whatever it says, I'm going to do and I'm going to obey. We just try that rather than the system you were brought into. And that's a really difficult thing to do when you're brought up a certain way. Now, we'll listen to those examples and you'll go, right on, right on, right on, Okay. But now I want to challenge your upbringing. Even in the evangelical church. Even what we're doing right now. Because this is what I've been struggling with for the last couple of years. If I started with scripture, let's be fair. Let's be fair to everyone. Let's be fair to the Jehovah's Witness. Let's be fair to the Mormons. And let's look at ourselves and go, if you started with this book, is this the type of gathering you would have come up with. For a thousand people to come, four different services, face forward, sing songs, listen to a message, go home, and say, I'm a part of Cornerstone Church. Did we really arrive at that exegetically? These are the things I've been questioning for the last couple of years, and especially of late. See, because when I started this church, I didn't think this way. I'll be honest with you. When I started the church back in 1994, here's what went through my mind. Okay, we're going to start a church here, so what do I need? And so I think to myself, what do I have to do to start a church in my evangelical framework? Well, I must have a building. I must have someone leading music. I must come up with a sermon. I must have a sound system, and I must have child care. Right? Seriously, those were the five absolutes right there. In my mind, because how do you do church without those things? Everyone knows you got to have a place to meet. You got to have a building and call it a church. Even though it was the Sinaloa cafeteria, so, you know, that was going to be our building. And we bought a little radio shack, you know, sound system and you got to have a sound system so people can hear you. we got a band, you know, to lead us in singing because you got to have singing. And I put a sermon together because you got to have sermon. And we had, you know, this one lady take care of all of our kids in one of the classrooms because you got to have that. And now my question is, says who? If I started with Scripture, and i got to apologize for this because I didn't, I mean, why, why look at Scripture when there's so many other great models to follow of people doing church and very successful? If I started with Scripture, what would I have come up with? Because you guys know within a few years, Cornerstone was the place to go. It was the popular church to go to. It was the biggest show in town. The most successful church. Says who? Is it success based upon what the Bible says is success? And what would we come up with? What type of gathering would we come up with if we started with Scripture? This is difficult, you guys. It's been difficult for me. But I want to be fair. I want to be fair to what we're talking about of exegesis and starting with Scripture. See, if I had started with Scripture, and I've been trying to think this through a lot and redefining success what would I emphasize? What would these gatherings have to have based upon what I know of Scripture? And I'm not talking about pulling a verse out of the Bible and saying, look, I found this one verse that says this. I just tried to objectively go, okay, what do I know? What do I know about the Bible? And this may wreck a lot of things that I, I was in charge of building. 
But if I started with scripture, I was thinking, okay, what does it emphasize? What does it emphasize? Obviously, it emphasizes the holiness, the glory of God. What, what would we do in these gatherings, though? And the first thing that I believe jumps out more than any other, and you study scripture, see if it's any different to you, that if a, a gathering of, of quote-unquote followers of Jesus got together, the one thing that should really stand out is love one another. Like when I read scripture and I just see dozens of times where God, Jesus commands, love one another, love one another. That if I were to gather these followers of Christ together, there must be incredible love in that gathering. I don't care how many people are there. I don't care how massive it is, how small it is. There's got to be incredible love for each other. That's what I would get from the Bible. And yet the truth is, is for years, I didn't care about that at all. What I cared about was having quality musician worship, you know, heartfelt worship and good teaching. And those aren't bad things. Of course you want that. But is that the priority? I believe teaching is one of the priorities, and I'll get to that, but, but first priority, I would say, is love. And yet I would say that we've had services for years and years and years where no one's loved each other. You come, you sit, you look forward, I give a message, you go home. I don't, I don't see that in Scripture. I don't see that the, the body of Christ or believers should ever get together without truly loving upon one another. And we live in a society that everyone's very, we live in America, so it's all about independence. I don't need you, you don't need me. I got my own thing figured out, I'm gonna work it out. And so I come in here, this was me. I don't like fellowship. I don't want to hang out with people. I like being alone. I get irritated. I get impatient. I get, you know, I do better by myself. You know, I, I, I shared this before, you know, one of the first things, you know, when Lisa and I were married a couple years, and she says, what do you love most about me, honey? And I said, you know, of all the people on this earth, you bug me the least. <laughs> okay, so that gives you a little insight into my mind. Now, she thought that was very romantic at that time. She goes, wow, really? The least? <laughs> you know, it's just. But, but honestly, when I'd go to church, I didn't really want to talk to anyone. I'd like to sit in the back and just have my time with God. Church is my time with God. You guys, I don't see that biblically. Yes, I have my time with God. Yes, I love him more than anyone. But the gathering was to love one another. How much, I look back and I'm, 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 I'm sick of this for, I, it really does literally make me, I'm not, I'm not going, oh, I've done nothing with my life, okay? There's good things. Good things have happened. I'm just saying, come on, this has got to be priority. Loving one another. That's what I would get if I started with scripture. And that's more than feelings like, oh, you know, Gabriel, I really feel love in my heart for you. It's not about that. It's about, no, I, I, I care about you, so do you got any needs right now? You guys, you guys okay financially? Can I help you out? Do you need a place to stay? You know, is Chantel getting on your nerves? You, you want to come over? You know, no, I'm just kidding. You know, but, but the whole thing is, is you, you, you like love in that way. We're a tangible love, not just, oh, we just have this great feeling, and sometimes we hold hands. It's, it's not about that. That's not what I see in Scripture. In fact, it says, let's stop loving with word. And let's start loving with action and truth. That's what I would see. And so I would see a loving amongst one another. I would also, um, second thing I'd see in scripture again, and it's not a verse, but I think it's just all through scripture, that the people gathering together had a focus of getting this message out. Is, don't you see that in scripture? Like they live, that's the only reason why they're on the earth is to proclaim this message, this gospel truth that we're talking about. And, and some of you, you know it doesn't even make sense to you. Your life doesn't make sense to you. Some of you have not told anyone about Jesus in years. And you know that doesn't sit well in your soul. Because when you read the scriptures, you go, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And you've never felt right about it. But then you meet a bunch of other people who don't do that either and, and it just becomes this comfortable thing and you gather and you have Bible studies together and you hang out and it's like, oh, you know, but we feel for each other more and, you know, a few of us cried at Bible study this week and so this must be good. Well, I don't see that as the emphasis of the New Testament. 
I see this commitment, these people that would gather saying, we've got to get this message out. Jesus Christ came. He died for the sins of the world. He rose from the grave and offers us to, a, an opportunity to be a part of the kingdom. This is good news. Uh, our sins of the past are going to be wiped away, and now we're saved. We can put to death the, the sins of the flesh right now, and there's this amazing grace that's the unsearchable riches that are in store for us, and we've got this whole future. We've got to get this word out. I, I read recently this week, I don't know who wrote it, but he says, you know, God's intention was that we would gather these fishers of men. The church was supposed to be fishers of men, where we go out and we're trying to, you know, sna- you know he goes, but instead of becoming fishers of men, we've become an aquarium. <laughs> wow, that's pretty good. You know, it's, it's just, we've lost that focus because we don't want to. Who wants to go talk to people that are going to reject them? And so let's just change things. We'll change your method. I don't really want to talk to even other people. So let's just change things and create a service where you don't have to talk to other people. You can just kind of get lost. Let's create a place where, you know, we can just get together and, you know, and, and have these Bible studies and not really reach out to the world because that's harder. But that's not what I see in Scripture. I'm going, no, this is it. And, and by this idea of proclaiming the message, what I would get from Scripture is that you would teach them to obey everything that God commanded. That's what he says in that great commission. Go, make disciples and teach them to obey everything I commanded. It's teaching people to have faith in Christ. But faith in Christ is not just an intellectual assent that yes, he died on the cross and rose from the grave. I don't believe that for a second. You wouldn't get that from scripture. Believing in Christ means you believe in Christ. You believe everything that he taught. You believe that you could trade in this life of comfort and luxury and all about me and making myself safe for the rest of the You can trade that in for a life that's better. You die to yourself and he'll give you something better. If you try to hold on to this and add Jesus to your life, it's not going to work. He won't allow that. That's what I would get from scripture. And so we need to proclaim that message. That's what the people gathering together, I would gather together. If I went just with the Bible, I would gather people that were focused on getting the word out and let's get together and let's encourage each other to keep doing this because we're going to want to stop. We're going to want to stop and just build our own little lives. So we've got to encourage people to keep on doing that. And you know what? And I'll help you. You're my brother. You're my sister. We're on this mission together. What's mine is yours. That's what I would get is loving one another and proclaiming the message together. Thirdly, I would see a a dependence on the Holy Spirit. When I read the New Testament, I go, man, the Holy Spirit, without the Holy Spirit, we're dead. There's no way we're going to pull this thing off. This is going to be supernatural. Uh, Holy Spirit or, or, or nothing. There's no way I can reach the holiness that God wants me to achieve on this earth aside from the Holy Spirit because I know me. I know where I'll take myself. There's no way I can f- figure out this mission God's called me to. I would read the scripture and go, okay, this Holy Spirit will guide me into all truth and he would direct us and we as a group of people, whoever, whether it's in my house, or at the park, wherever, the people that gathered together, we'd go, okay, come on, God, Holy Spirit, show us what to do next. Where do we go? And we'd really surrender ourselves to him. Fourthly, another thing that I just see all throughout the New Testament is this idea of communion. Now, this is weird to me, honestly, because I, in my mind, I wouldn't put so much emphasis on communion but it seems like in the New Testament, I mean, am I wrong? It seems like they really would intentionally get together from house to house to break bread and take the cup. They would go from house to house doing that. Why? They would get together reminding each other, look, this is what matters. They would have meals together, and then at the end they would break the bread and go, come on, we're a part of something bigger, and they'd break that bread. Remember, Jesus' body was broken for us. Let's remember that. They'd take the cup together. Look, you know, look in each other in the eyes. Look, this is what we're about, right? We're committed to this. This is the most important thing and the fifth thing and there's many more but these were the things that I thought must take place was prayer I would gather people together to pray pray with these people and and we would pray to come into the presence of God we would pray and say God we're about your kingdom and so help us understand how to further your kingdom let's figure this thing out if I were to start all over I would just gather some people for those things. I would just gather some people and go, man, let's just love on each other because we believe in this mission. Let's encourage each other. We gotta keep just reaching the world with this amazing message and put other things aside. 
I would get together and we would pray and we would pray for the leading of the Holy Spirit and we would break bread with one another. And, and because my gift is teaching, I would do some of the teaching in that setting or, or I, you know, and, and if there were other groups, you know, and if it got too big, it's like, okay, you do some teaching. You do some, and we wouldn't care so much about the superstar speaker or whatever. It would just be, man, who can teach me the word of God? We love the word of God. See, that's what I would do if I started all over. And if I gathered a group of people who loved on each other like that and broke bread with each other like that and went out proclaiming the message out like that, then I believe I could rightfully call it a church. And I've really, questioning, I've really been questioning whether or not we have the right to call ourselves a church unless we're doing those things. Otherwise, we're redefining it. Otherwise, I could say, well, I, I went swimming the other day, so I'm a Navy SEAL. You, you know? <laughs> well, they swim. You, you know, it, it's, a, it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's just this whole idea of, wait, we call people followers of Christ even though they don't follow him. That doesn't make sense to me. Doesn't it make sense that, they, well, but they go to church. That doesn't make you a believer, a follower. And, and in the same way, well, I'm a part of the church. Why? Because you attend one of these services we have? Is that really what God called the church in Scripture? Or was it this group of people that got together and encouraged each other that way and just truly loved on each other? See, I, I just, here's the thing. Understand, I am not saying that these services are bad. I think this is a good thing. I think it's a good thing that we've done. Is it the best thing and is it the commanded thing? That's what I question. I would say no. Is it good to, I'd rather you be here than at a movie, you know? So in that way, it's good. You're gonna hear the word of God. You're gonna be together with, with other believers and that's, that's a good thing. We're gonna worship God. I'm just saying the priority. I mean, shouldn't our energies be prioritized and used on what is commanded first, Right? Okay, what is commanded? So I would, see, if I had it over to do it over again, I'd go, okay, what's commanded? Commanded, I must love, I must do this, I must do this, so let me gather that. Now, if we want to have services like this where some of you come and you want to learn stuff and maybe some of you haven't made the commitment yet, you're not heart, full on, you know, followers of Jesus, but we can do that. There's nothing wrong with that. Services are fine, they're fine. But what's commanded, what's commanded is this getting together and practicing all these one another's, which we really can't do in a room this size. You really can't love on one another. You really can't serve one another. I mean, I mean, the one another, the Bible, here's the commands, love one another, be at peace with one another, show hospitality with one another, honor one another, receive one another, do not fight with one another, serve one another, don't envy one another, admonish one another, greet one another, care for one another, bear the burdens of one another, show deference to one another, forgive one another, be kind to one another, submit to one another, don't lie to one another, provoke to good works one another, comfort one another, Concern yourselves in the affairs of one another. Don't hate one another. Don't speak evil of one another. But pray for one another. Be like-minded toward one another. Do not hold a grudge against one another. Highly esteem one another. Don't be partial toward one another. Have fellowship with one another. Edify one another. Teach one another. Do good to one another. Exhort one another. Minister spiritual gifts to one another. These are the commands of Scripture. And I'm going, are we really doing that? Or do we have one guy up here teaching? And we sing some songs together. And we call it church? I don't think we have the right to do that. Now some of you are living out what we were talking about this week. You're getting together in groups. You're getting together in your communities. And you're being the church. Because you're doing these one another's. But my point is we've got to stop calling this church. We can call this service. Or we can call it happy time. We can call it whatever you want. <laughs> I just don't feel comfortable calling this church, biblically. If I'm gonna be fair to these different cults and fair to everyone else, I gotta go back to scripture and go, here it is. I believe that to call this church is unbiblical. And I, I confess that I have called it church in the past because I, I just started with what people told me I was supposed to do. And now I'm looking back at scripture and here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm gonna ask you to do something extremely difficult this week just like I asked those Mormons to do, just like I asked the Jehovah's Witnesses to do, now I'm gonna ask a bunch of evangelicals to do. 
I want you to go back to Scripture this week and say what is obviously in Scripture. What does Scripture really teach and what would your life look like if you started with the Word of God and rethink this. This is what I've been doing for the last couple of years. Just thinking, okay, if I just had this book on an island, what would I come up with? What would I do? And I will tell you right now, coming from me, I hate it. A lot of things I hate. Um, I think that's too strong. I, I just really don't enjoy that every bone in my body fights against doing some of this stuff because I don't feel like doing this a lot of times. And yet when I do it, I feel at peace. And I know it's right. Um, but I shared a couple of weeks ago, like we, you know, we took in a family and I, I got eight kids running around my house now. Eight. There's 13 of us in this house. I wake up every morning and go, this stinks. <laughs> I do. And I wake up every morning and go, there better be a heaven. <laughs> I'm dead serious. And I love that part of it. So I go, this is what he was talking about. Like, there better be a reward in this. If, if there's no resurrection from the dead, like Paul says, I'm above all men most to be pitied, then this looks really dumb. I look at my bank account, I look at everything and go, this is really dumb if there's no heaven. This better be right. There better be a heaven. And that's the way, but I, I'm, I'm feeling more peace than ever though. I'm going, man, this is right. This is right. I, this is biblical though. And I tell you, do you, you know what it feels like? Yeah, it's, it's difficult to just have your whole house in disarray and everything else, but then to see this kid who was homeless, you know, just this, the one, one of them, the three-year-old, just grabbing my leg and calling me daddy and laughing hysterically, laughing like to where he can't even control himself as I'm throwing him in the air. And I'm going, man, have I ever in my life painted a better picture of God as a father to the fatherless. Have I ever done that? So I'm looking at that kid and go, man, that's exactly what Jesus did for me. He took me in. God took me in. He adopted me. He allowed me to call him father. He's got me laughing hysterically. And I'm going, you know what? That's what I'm supposed to be doing. And, and I need to be encouraged by other people to say, you know what? Yeah, hold on. Keep doing that. I know it's hard. It's hard to wake up every morning. It's hard to go to bed every night. It's difficult. But... It's, got, it's worth it. I mean, I'm sure Paul had those times when he's being beaten, when he has rocks thrown at him, when he's shipwrecked in the middle of the ocean, just going, man, what in the world am I doing here? And he goes, but it, it better be worth it. See, it makes sense. And I'm just saying that it is not easy. It's not easy for me at all. And it's not going to be easy for you. Um, you know, people say, well, what's, what's the end result of all this, Francis? What's the church going to look like in five years? I have no clue. My elders don't have any clue. I have no idea what my life's going to look like at the end of this. I just want to be fair to the scriptures and start with the scriptures and say, for now, all I know is I can't call this church anymore. And we're trying to gather people together to be the church. And I don't know what these things will look like in the future or if we'll have these things. But we've got to start with the priority and we've got to decide what is sacred and what is not. If this is sacred, then we've got to start getting together and loving in each other and caring for one another, forgiving each other, putting up with each other, and, and caring for the needs of the world, going out and rescuing and being Christ to other people. These services are not sacred, because I don't see that. And yet some of you will want to hold these services sacred because that's what you were raised with. And I'm saying, go back to this book. Let's figure this out. Next week, we are have, having services, okay? <laughs> Easter, just for now, this is what we're doing, but I'm telling you, I don't know where it's going. I don't know where my life is going. All I know is I'm finally feeling peace because I'm aligning myself with this book, and it's not easy, but man, it's just right.